Heather Frederick, I'm the Chief Financial Officer. Sherry Brown, representing District 4. Faith Schulstrom, representing District 5. Frank Barbieri's. Carmen Campbell, representing District 6. Marsha Andrews. Scott Shaw, representing District 3. And we have board member Marsha Andrews, and we also have um, Mr. Corey Smith. Great, thank you. Um, there's no Good one morning. here from the public, so if we don't have any public comments online, I, we can move on. Um, the minutes were not available for this meeting, so we'll do them at our next meeting. So I'll hand it over to Heather for our presentation. So the main purpose of this meeting is to go over the uh, Budget Advisory Committee report to the board. Um, since that is uh, one of the requirements uh, that's within uh, board policy. Uh, but since our last meeting, we did have some updates, and um, those updates were presented to the, the board on June 1st. So I wanted to go through that June 1st uh, board workshop presentation uh, to just update the committee on some positive information that we received um, since our last meeting. It's always good to get positive information. It, it, it definitely is. Uh, so we're going to just give, um, when our last meeting, uh, I, I had talked about that we expected general fund budget to, um, in FY22, to decline slightly, um, but based on some information we received from the state that I had mentioned that we were waiting on, uh, we are now expecting that our fund balance is actually going to remain flat, and it's actually most likely going to increase slightly. Uh, and our general fund budget for FY23 is now balanced. Um, so we were uh, potentially a little bit short the last time I presented, um, but based on some positive information that uh, increase in the property values, uh, our budget is balanced and we are expecting to even have a, a bit of a surplus. Uh, the capital budget is also balanced. And with the special revenue funds, those will continue to increase from now all the way through final adoption and even after final adoption as those grants are received because we make budget amendments after we receive the, the actual awards from either the state or the federal government. Uh, we were able to get an update of the FY21 financial condition ratio. And this is a comparison of all uh, the districts across the state. Um, it does seem like the information lags a little uh, just because we wait for it to, to receive the official information from the Florida Department of Education and it always lags a bit. Uh, but you can see that uh, Palm Beach County is the orange line and we were originally um, estimating that our um, unrestricted uh, portion of our fund balance would be closer to 13% but we came in at 12%. Uh, which is aligned with uh, Miami-Dade. And you can see that spike uh, that we see in FY20 and 20, from 20 to 21 is very consistent to the spike we had back uh, during the Great Recession um, in 2010 and 11. And so we're just like back uh, with during the Great Recession, uh, we're expecting the fund balance to remain um, somewhat steady and then we'll slowly start to see a decline. Um, in that fund balance. Uh, you can see the significant uh, increase that we have um, in orange, you know, jumping up from 17% to over 20%. Uh, so you can see the increase in the, the fund balance and the, the amount of the unassigned and the assigned portion of the fund balance increased uh, pretty consistently um, among all the other urban seven districts. Uh, Duval is the only one that really remained flat. Uh, um, Duval and also Broward. Um, but for the most part, you can see all the other districts increased pretty significantly. And that, and our increase or our fund balance or financial condition ratio of the 12% is consistent with the statewide average of 11.98%. Uh, I presented this at our last meeting, and this is, um, this is the, actually the same exact uh, slide. Uh, but that was just the updated information as to where we stand with our average teacher salary um, in the state of Florida. Our general fund budget is $2.4 billion. Um, it's likely going to be um, higher than that. Um, expected to go up you know, closer to $2.5 billion. We went over all of the FEFP detail um, in a significant amount of detail in our last meeting. 
the only difference is instead of doing the comparison to the third calculation, because that was what was the most recent uh, during our last meeting, uh, I now did the comparison based on the fourth calculation. And by looking at the fourth calculation, the increase, uh, the adjustment in the unweighted FTE, um, all of that information is the same. Um, the change uh, really comes down to our overall increase um, year over year. Uh, was initially uh, going to be closer to $60 million. It's more, it's, our actual increase is going to be $49 million. And that's a result of uh, when I was um, telling you about FY22 and closing out FY22, there was a lot of information we were still waiting on from the state, uh, one of them being the adjustment in the fourth calculation, which is normally very minor. Um, but this year it was much more significant um, because of the adjustment with the um, Family Empowerment Scholarships. I had told the committee I was um, thinking that the adjustment would be between one and um, five million dollars. Uh, it was actually $20 million, which is what we had estimated the impact of the Family Empowerment Scholarships. We just didn't expect that the Florida Department of Ed was going to fully fund that adjustment related to um, the Family Empowerment Scholarships. So we always try to be very conservative, um, uh, but we were happy to see that we, we did receive the full amount of funding back um, in the fourth um, calculation. So that then just reduced um, the increase uh, when comparing to FY23. In looking at, you know, and starting with the $49 million after taking the adjustment for um, charter schools and family empowerment scholarship, we talked about the increase in the um, Florida retirement system, um, increasing the contingency, a board contingency to remain in compliance with board policy, as well as the increase in FPL rates. We talked about the changes in staffing. The only other adjustment I had um, from our last meeting was originally I had um, a significant amount in staffing related to, it was almost $8 million for um, ESC as well, well as uh, ESOL um, teaching staff and um, also paraprofessionals that we had shifted into the ESSER funds. And I had that as a, um, a budget cost uh, but when I was, when we were doing a more detailed review of the budget, when we moved those positions into ESSER, we never actually reduced the budget in those school sites. So it actually isn't a true cost for the next year. It was just that that was money that dropped into additional savings within our um, fund balance to help us balance in, in FY22. So it's not actually an additional cost for FY23. Uh, so we're looking at a projected um, surplus of 25 million, uh, but we know that uh, in the statute and uh, what was approved by the legislature, uh, there was an increase in the teacher compensation categorical. Um, that's about $14.7 million. That's actually gonna be reduced a little bit as well um, because I just attended a conference, the Florida School Finance Officers Conference last week, and as part of that, uh, there are representatives from the Florida Department of Education and the Family Empowerment Scholarship vouchers, um, the money that's um, going to the private schools, they actually receive a portion of all categoricals, including the teacher salary compensation. So not all of that is for district operated schools or even charter schools. A portion of that is also going to um, the, the private schools. Although they're not required to follow the same um, requirements in terms of spending, they are still receiving a portion of that. Um, so we don't have to actually set aside the full 14.7 million um, because it's going to be, it, it's included within that pass through for the vouchers. There was also the legislative mandate to increase the hourly rate to $15 per hour for all district employees by October 1st. And I'm happy to report that we've settled with all of our unions. Uh, we settled, uh, the board approved the agreement with PBA uh, last night at the board meeting. Uh, but as part of our negotiations with SEIU and ASOP, we included in there already the settlement to increase um, every single uh, minimum wage worker up to a minimum of $15 per hour. And we, didn't, we made it effective as of July 1st instead of waiting until October 1st. Um, so that's built into our FY23 budget as well. 
So with that, we had a, with those two adjustments, we had a slight um, deficit of eight hundred thousand dollars, but we received the preliminary uh, tax roll increases um, from um, from the county, and they were higher than anticipated. Um, so we originally uh, the uh, FEFP was built on an increase of a seven point five percent increase in property values. The preliminary is coming out at eighteen point eight percent. Uh, so it's significantly higher um, than the projected. That doesn't impact, that doesn't mean we're going to see an, a 20% increase in our per student funding because this, what the state is going to do, what the Florida Department of Education is going to do, they're going to reduce our millage rate that they had the required local effort to make up for that increase in property values. We will see an increase in the referendum and we will see an increase in the discretionary millage as well as within the capital budget. So we will see a benefit from this increase in property values, um, but you won't see it as an increase in that per student funding. That's still going to stay the same. But we no longer have a deficit. Uh, we're just waiting for the final uh, property values to be released, and at that point we'll make the adjustment, but the, the amount of our increase far exceeds um, the, the small deficit that we had on June 1st. Our last meeting, I wasn't able to go through the department changes because our meeting was on uh, May 5th and our last meeting with the departments was on May 6th. Um, so I was able to, with the board, I did give a highlight of that we were gonna have some um, changes um, primarily related to um, increased operational costs, uh, but I'll be able to walk through each of those changes. So it's a total in the general fund of 3.3 million, almost 3.4 million, Increase in capital, which includes capital maintenance transfer, as well as um, the capital, as well as capital projects, but um, all within uh, maintenance transfer and some of the overhead related to capital projects, and then the internal service fund. And we're looking to add an additional 28 FTE. Heather, are those new employees or transfers from other departments that are be? that are affected by reorganization or something? Those are new and it's primary custodial staff. Yeah. And so, and, and we'll go through, uh, we'll go through that. So within looking at the FTE of uh, starting with the governance, um, which represents the general counsel to the board as well as the, the office of inspector general, uh, we're going to be adding back the deputy general counsel position. When Ms. Julia Enrico um, left the district, that position was frozen with the intention to save money uh, for one year, and then that position was supposed to be brought back. Um, Ms. Bernard stepped into Ms. Rico's position, and so now this would give her the ability to backfill her old position. And that was all, always the intention uh, when uh, Ms. Rico left, um, and that's over a year ago. There's also some additional software uh, that uh, the uh, general counsel is, it, it needs to uh, uh, procure. Within the inspector general's uh, department, uh, they wanted to add a intake, a complaint, a complaint intake coordinator, because they all of the complaints come into the inspector general's office, and then they filter them out to all the different departments within the district. There's some that they monitor, and then there's some that go to HR, some that go to school police. Um, so this position would monitor all of those um, complaints as well as the final conclusion of all of those complaints to make sure that all of them are addressed. So that's the purpose of that position. In looking at um, all the other departments, we have the chief of staff, uh, which has a small increase related to in-county travel. Because if you recall, when we were going through uh, the difficult times during the pandemic and, and we were facing uh, potential budget reductions, uh, travel was one of the items that we did cut from the budget. And so there's a, a need to increase the in-county travel. In looking at the chief academic office um, division, adding a director of athletics. Yeah. So I, I was just, I was waiting for you. So um, the big increase there is the software program or? For which, for under the CAO? Yeah. Well, one is the, yeah, the director of athletics and then the other larger ones are related to the software programs. And those are, because a lot of these programs are not renewed on an annual basis, 
it's uh, every three years. And so that's what the increases are. The choice lottery platform um, program, that one is new because the one that we have is out of date. The provider was not updating it anymore, so we had to purchase a new software, so that one was new. Um, Cognia, uh, that's the, the membership that we need to be a part of is for our accreditation purposes, and we're adding three new schools, so we need to add three more schools onto, um, for membership purposes. As soon as we receive a school number, even though the school's not open, we have to start paying. Um, and then the accreditation, the accreditation is every five years. Uh, so that's over $100,000 on just costs related that go along with the whole accreditation process. So it's a lot of miscellaneous um, uh, amounts within there that add up to the 671000 And we didn't have a director of athletics or it was in another department? We did not have a director of athletics. It was actually a new job description that was approved at, uh, I believe, two meetings ago by the board. Uh, we had a manager of athletics, and so now there is a need. I don't know if you've been seeing the, uh, the increase uh, in, there, there definitely has, athletics has been highlighted, especially after the pandemic and the need for students for that to be a priority. And we've had a challenge in our district. Um, we've had a lot of coaches retire recently, and we've had difficulty in trying to fill those positions. And so that's, we felt like there was a need to be more competitive uh, with other districts across the country. And so that's why they felt like it was a priority that to make this a director level position. I'm just surprised we didn't have one. And the, I, it's a very small team that's working on athletics and they do an outstanding job. And I do expect that there's going to, you know, after this is finalized, I do expect that there will be uh, recommendations that come out of additional things that we'll have to do in, in terms of our athletics program to be more competitive. Like oh. salaries. <laughs> we are, yeah, we definitely need to look at the, the supplements uh, that we provide our coaches. Uh, that's not included in the FY23 budget, but I'm sure that that's something that is, is, is definitely top of mind. Um, within uh, my division, uh, we have, I have an increase of $52,000 uh, that's related to, primarily related to our increase in the cost of our armored car service. Um, it's, we've had very uh, a significant difficulty with, um, with the provider, with having staffing, you know, they're have, they are facing the same challenges we, we face, uh, but it's in policy that we provide this armored car service. Um, so it's an, it's an increase that uh, we need to pay, unfortunately. We also, just like with our membership uh, related to the whole accreditation process, uh, we have, we need to add, um, we have internal accounts for those schools, we have a program, so as soon as those schools are added, we have to um, increase uh, the schools and, and add the, the additional licenses for that. We're seeing overall increases in property insurance uh, premiums, and we have, we, we monitor all of our time for those that are hourly workers on uh, TCD devices, and so we're constantly replacing those devices. Um, so that's what that um, increase is within the capital. And then within the internal service fund, we're adding a, uh, which is outside of the general fund. Uh, those are, are funds that are, are paid for by premiums um, that are charged to the district. We're adding a health specialist, um, as well as we had um, some additional uh, increases in our um, in our insurance, other insurance premiums, including, including cyber liability. Any questions on those? Uh, within the chief information officer, the 2.7 million is all within capital maintenance transfer and it's related to software license renewals. So they're not new softwares, it's just renewals for existing softwares. And like I, and like I said, a lot of them are not on annual renewals. Some of them are every three years, and then we're just also seeing a, an increase. So now we get to the chief operating officer, where is, you have the bulk of the increase in FTE. And so what we're doing is we're adding back 21 custodial rovers and two custodial coordinators. During, um, our, 
during a lot of our budget reductions, and for those of you who have been on the committee for many years, know that custodians, rovers were one of the first uh, areas that we cut at the schools. We, have, we then shifted over, instead of hiring back the custodial rovers, we tried to work with a temp company because we've had significant vacancies ever since the pandemic. And we've had a difficulty filling those custodial positions. So we tried last, the last two years working with a temp agency. The temp agency has not been able to keep up with the demand. And so we're shifting some of the funds that we were, that we were spending for, on the temp agency and we're actually, we're going to actually try to hire custodians. We think with the increase in the minimum hourly rate to $15 per hour, because our custodians were our lowest paid, um, they were at $11.09. So we're hoping with the increase to $15 per hour, we'll have the ability to actually fill the vacant positions we have, and then also provide an additional pool of, of rovers so that when those when custodians are out at the school sites, we can provide um, additional support. Because it has been difficult for the schools, the existing custodians, they've been working a significant amount of overtime to make sure to keep our schools clean. So that's where the bulk of the FTE is going, is in the custodial rovers. So and then the, some of that's offset by Some the, of that is going to be offset by and the overtime. Right. And it won't be uh, initially for the temps. There's some that we're going to have to continue um, for the first part, first half of the year. Um, but I do expect by the following year, we would see a million dollar offset of the uh, of, of what we were spending on the temps. And then in looking at um, capital, is there a question? Smith, yes. Question. Yep, Mr. Smith. Just on the on the existing custodians, are they being bumped? No, none of none of them are being bumped, and, and they would have the the option to apply for the rover positions. Uh, we're just trying to uh, to provide support for the custodians that we have, so it's just adding gotcha. additional. Okay. Thank you. And then within. Uh, uh, the other initiatives within um, the COO's division is uh, increasing the use of contracted transportation. We have significant number of vacancies in bus drivers, um, and so it's not eliminating any bus driver positions, it's just expanding the use of, of contracted transportation, especially for some of the harder routes of um, the ESE students, because those change on almost a daily basis based on the ESE students being added. Um, and so to minimize the impact of our existing bus drivers and changing their routes, um, instead increasing the use of contracted transportation. So that's the most significant cost uh, within that capital um, component. And then with all of the, the building that we're doing and all the um, deferred maintenance that we continue to work on, um, adding an additional educational planning specialist. So that's an overview of all the changes within the department. And so now Ms. Evans is going to, to give you an overview of the capital budget. Okay, good morning everybody. Let me make sure this is gonna work, yeah. Okay, so I wanted to start off with a brief sales tax update. Um, and Sherry knows this inside and out, but sales tax revenues continue to come in ahead of schedule. This is through April, I'll t and as of April, we were at 118% of projection. Through May, we're at 120% of projection. Um, I. I there's a lot of talk right now about recession. So if, if today was the day we'd have to decide if we're extending it another year or not, um, I would predict that we, we may shut the, we may sunset and end the year early. Um, if there is a significant slowdown in the economy, that certainly would impact this. And we have a few years. Um, th this would be ending in 2026 or 2027. So we've, we've got a little ways to, or 2025 and 2026. We have a little ways to go before we make that decision. Um, this data is up through March, sales tax expenditures, purchase orders, um, the, the line of credit, interest earnings. Everything's working really well. We're at 50% of the revenues for the 10-year tax. And then we did want to talk a little bit. We, we have talked about this in depth with the sales tax oversight committee, um, really looking at what we're going to do. You all heard we have inflation everywhere, costs going up. It's specifically challenging with construction and has been for quite a while. So there's a lot of concern as to how we're going to finish all the projects. So this is the current plan. 
Um, this gets updated very frequently, um, constantly looking at every project as, as contracts are awarded. But within the sales tax, we had a sales tax reserve. Um, at the time of doing this, it was at 55 million. We had 8.4 million in interest earnings, and that will continue to rise as now that rates are rising. Um, there's addition, I'm projecting additional revenue. This is assuming the sales tax does end a year early, but that trigger is based on September 1st, which is revenue received or earned through June. So it, when we hit that September date, if we've hit that point that we're going to trigger the sunset, we have six more months of revenue coming in. So I'm projecting that's an extra 122 million. Um, and then we also have, have requested to change the funding on four projects, actually five, but four of them are um, strictly because we want to free up money in the sales tax. We're going to finance those instead. The last one, um, the scope is changing. We're still doing the deferred maintenance at River Beach Prep, but it's going to be bigger than that, and we're going to be adding a new building in for North Tech. So the scope is changing significantly, and I would be borrowing for that as well, which would free up all total 89 million of sales tax that's set aside for projects that could be set aside in a pool to deal with cost overruns. So those two buckets together, it's about 275 million that is available for increased cost. The projections we have right now is about 222 million that we think we're going to experience. Um, a lot of that, the biggest number, the 190 million, is an estimate coming from our outside consultant that's helping us manage the projects. So as we're doing this, we'll be taking each individual item to the board. Everyone will be approved. We're just trying to come up with estimates of where we're at. So based on this strategy, we would still be able to complete everything on the referendum list. And I think that's what everyone wants to ensure. Leanne, what, what was the thought on f the reason to finance those projects instead of take them from the tax? Um, oh, if, if we finance them, then they're not funded with a sales tax. It frees up the sales tax dollars to be used for cost overruns on other projects. So we're going to switch them over, pay for them out of, we'll use COPS to finance them, and they'll be repaid out of millage, out of property tax revenue. So that sales tax, instead of spending sales tax on these projects, we're going to fund them in another way. Okay. We're still tracking them all. They still are on the reports for the sales tax oversight committee. It's just going to be switching from one page to another. Um, so none said a sales tax funded, it's funded from other sources. The question and I done. always ask in that, if, if those are projects are, are, are funded by, um, can they be repaid early? Are there going to be restrictions on any of that financing? We're actually, we're working that? on that financing right now. We haven't priced yet, but those projects are going to be amortized over seven years. I don't want to be paying on roof replacements and floors and windows over 25 years. So there's actually a separate schedule with those projects. So we'd be amortizing them over a much shorter period of time. Yeah. Okay. There's good questions though. So overall with the capital budget, um, we, we are balanced for FY23, and as Ms. Frederick mentioned, um, property values did come in higher than projected, so we have a surplus at this point. Um, we're still working on the rest of the capital plan, so um, I won't be surprised if we end up seeing the reserves increase um, and that money being used to help balance FY24, 25, and 26. Uh, but we do have it um, balanced at this point. Some of the additions, you know, when we do the capital plan, it's much like what um, Heather does with the operating budget. We go through every line item all over again. The difference is we have a 10-year capital plan. So we take that capital plan and say, what changes do you need to make on an annual basis? So some of the additions that have been added in is the hard panic solution for all sites. Um, all employees are going to get another badge that has a button. This was on the news. Um, it was approved by the board last night. <coughs> So a, a way to contact um, security, school police, sheriff's department. Um, that's supposed to be implemented um, for all school sites before start of school. So we actually had a kickoff meeting this morning about that. Um, we're um, changing, I mentioned earlier, River Beach Prep and North Tech. We're changing the scope of that and build, including North Tech. There's going to be addition, an addition for South Intensive um, at the old South Tech site. Um, modernization of West Transportation has been added. <coughs> um, media center upgrades for all the high schools. We've accelerated a lot of the, the building envelope maintenance program projects, which is a lot of painting, waterproofing, sealing of buildings. We've expedited those into FY23. 
um, adding digital marquees at the high schools and adding guard shacks in the high schools. Again, those, that's a security measure. And these slides were ones that, um, oops, Mr. Smith has a question. Yeah, just quick um, on the south. Well, you no, know I'll shut up because that's okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Can, yeah, can you repeat that? Looks like you're going to explain what I was going to ask. So. Oh, I am. Okay. Um, this is some more in-depth information. And actually, actually, Mr. Um, Sanchez went through this with the board, but this is just some more information about what we're doing. This is a River Beach Prep and North Tech. Um, there's a current River Beach Prep that's on Garden Road in River Beach. And there's going to be um, significant renovation to the existing buildings and an addition of an adult ed facility so that the campus can be used by our students during the day and adults at night. And there's still a lot of work on the programming side for that, um, but it's bringing North Tech in with, with a lot of career options for the public and for our students. That's estimated um, at $40 million, which will be financed um, with COPS. Um, Inlet Grove is um, the old Suncoast campus that's being utilized by Inlet Grove, which is a charter school. Um, there is money in the sales tax for facility renewal. Um, they've estimated an increase. They're increasing that dollar amount. There's, there's more work needed there than was included in the budget. So that will be covered with sales tax. And then South Intensive, um, they're currently operating in a group of modulars and portables um, near the old South Tech, on the old South Tech campus. We're going to be going in and completely renovating building two, which is a concrete block building. They're gonna go out and strip it and redo it and um, make that the campus for South Intensive. So they'll be in a regular building instead of portables. If, if, if the, um, on the in Lake Grove funding, how does that relate to the money they're already getting from sales tax? Is this included as part of that $30 million? It is. So this um, is not on top of that. It's, in, it's part of it. It's all part of it. Okay. The original estimate was $18 million. It's going to be increased to 30 Okay, and other proposed changes on the construction side. There is, um, the board is working with the city of West Palm Beach on some transferable development rights, which is basically selling the airspace above the Dreyfus High School, School of the Arts. Um, we're never going to build a high-rise building or a five-story building, so we can sell those and we're selling them to the city. Um, there's an estimated $8 million revenue source coming in from that, and we're recommending that half of it be designated for improvements at Dreyfus, and the other half would be um, used for improvements on other historic properties, such as Northboro Elementary and Jupiter Elementary. Um, there's also a historic grant that's been approved for Roosevelt Full Service. Um, that would be, when, once it's approved and finalized, that will also be added into the capital budget and used for the design of that building. So this is the list of all the construction projects in the plan. Um, the dollar amount at the top is just for FY23, but I've included all the projects from the entire capital plan. So of that, that big budget for FY23, 446 million of it is tied up in construction projects. The biggest one right now is the, the new high school, um, Triple O High School. The total budget there's 105 million. And it's funded in FY22. It's just starting construction, so a lot of that will carry forward into FY23. The new buildings, I think I've already referenced, um, the West Transportation, the South Intensive Renovation, um, the North Tech River Beach Prep um, Renovation. We've got in red um, beside Forest Hill High School, the addition and parking lot. We're still trying to figure out what to do there. There's, um, we had thought we were going to put an addition there um, if we got land from the city. The city is going to give us some land or a long-term lease for some parking, but not enough for a new building. So there's also a lot of boundary shifts that are changed taking place between all the high schools because of the new one that will be opening in FY23. So that, those two projects are delayed right now as we figure out exactly what we need to do at Forest Hill High School. Um, this is the slide that I can't do a capital budget presentation without throwing in there. This is the debt service capacity. And, and this slide will also change with the increase in property values. The red line at the top is 50% of the one and a half mills. So as the property values rise, that line will also rise up. 
the green line is 50% of two mills, which I can never forget. We used to have two mills for capital, so I always track that. The brown or tan areas is debt that's already been issued, and the blue is the debt service for new debt issues that are coming up. So we talked about moving those projects from sales tax into COPS. Those are being amortized in FY23 through 29. That, that's why those numbers are a little higher. So there is capacity to borrow everything we've planned to borrow. That, that's why this is included, just to verify that we're staying in compliance with school board policy. And then the other facility projects, we have facility renewals that are funded with sales tax. And as we've discussed, um, four large projects are being moved into COPS borrowing within facility renewal projects. And then there's a lot of other things, such as roofing and other um, building envelope projects, air conditioning projects media centers, um, there's, a, there's a lot of other work going on in our facilities, so that, that's a total of $642 million. Do you have any idea what our progress has been on life safety issues? I'm, we can bring that back at a future meeting. That actually goes to the board every year to show the comprehensive safety inspection report, and those numbers continue to decrease. Um, as um, all the deferred maintenance projects are done, that's eliminating a lot of the ones they term as capital that need a capital fix. Um, the ones that continue to pop up from year to year are ones when a school is keeping a door propped open or storing a box in an incorrect way, and those are safety violations. But the, the big ones are all being resolved with these um, deferred maintenance projects that are funded with a sales tax. And, and some of those will go away with some of the modernization yes. projects too. Yes. And they, like Ms. Evans said, they've continued to improve each year, and they've also incorporated some recommendations from the Auditor General where they're classifying um, the, the findings as significant versus immaterial, because a lot of them, you know, it might look like a huge number, but it really isn't truly a true, I don't want to say it's not a safety issue, but it, it's, it's very minor. And so they do rank those so that, they may, that they're doing the ones that are significant first. So do you, what's the status of significant ones then? Well, it, they're significantly down, and, and we can bring it back. I can actually, what I can do is just email it to the committee. The, they recently presented that to the board, and so I can provide that report. And then I've grouped some projects together, security projects, so of course, very important to us. Um, we're adding that new panic solution in that will be um, active for the start of school. Um, and we continue to um, finish up and wrap up all the security projects, everything that's been recommended. Um, that, that's certainly a priority for the district to get these projects done. Um, we're also spending money on school buses, replacing support vehicle replacements. Like those are maintenance vehicles. Um, the vans used to transport equipment and materials to schools. Um, contractor transportation, which Ms. Frederick mentioned. Um, and then for, for, for under equipment, um, continue to do furniture replacement. Musical instruments were added in two years ago, and this year we've added in um, a plan to update the equipment in all the school TV studios. I, I talked to somebody from the TV station yesterday, and they were just so excited that they're going to get to update all of those. So it makes a big difference in the schools. Education technology, um, that's a lot of it is providing all the flat panels that the schools have. Um, it's 18 million this in FY23. That's down. We were spending a lot more, but the bulk of those flat panels have been placed in the classrooms. So at this point, they're still working on some audio enhancement and some other things, but that is going to continue to dwindle down. And then when those flat panels start to age out, their budgets will spike up again. And that's planned within that 10 year capital plan. We expect that to happen. And technology continues to increase. Um, refreshing all the computers. We're buying additional Chromebooks for the school so they have a supply of them for when one is damaged. It gets sent out to repair, and right now the student just doesn't have a Chromebook. So we're going, they're going to have a, a, a supply that they can use to make sure students have Chromebooks, even if theirs has been damaged. We are seeing a lot of things shift from the capital budget to the maintenance transfer. Um, more and more technology is being done as licenses and subscriptions and cloud-based. So in the old days, we used to buy it and install it and store the disk. That's in the capital budget. Once it's switched to where it's all in the cloud, we have to transfer from capital to the operating budget to the maintenance transfer to pay for it. So we're seeing some shifts within technology. 
um, but we are continuing to increase budgets for cyber insurance and making sure we have adequate computers for all the students. And does that include for students to take home? Yes, they can take those computers home. Um, property and flood insurance is funded with capital. Um, charter schools is being funded from the state in FY23. And the reserves, this, as a, this, this is a pretty high number. Um, that's probably going to change as we go through the rest of the capital plan exercise. Um, a lot, some of that is the sales tax reserve, that 54 million I showed at the very beginning that's in the sales tax reserve is included in here. The 8 million of interest earnings for sales tax is in here. So a lot of this is really earmarked for other things. It, it's not, it's in a reserve, but we know what it's going to be used for. So we're still working on the entire capital plan. We have, we started the process with a really good draft because we have that ongoing 10 year plan. We're just doing some updates right now and we'll be bringing that back to the board most likely in July, um, July or August. I'm not sure which date. I'm not sure if it's been set yet. Yeah, it will be in August. Okay. Um, and then it's, it will be adopted just before the budget in September. Um, continue to look at things like changes to cost for student station, um, if DOE has to approve projects, funding for charter schools, um, maintenance needs, uh, all those things are funded through capital. So we continue to watch those. And we talked about rising construction costs and how that's impacting our projects. So um, continuing to monitor those and we'll be updating the plan as needed. And with capital, um, since they do do a 10 year plan, each year it's not just creating a new budget, it's just minor changes mm -hmm. um, from year to year. I think that's it. Are there any other questions for capital? Back to you. All right, so with the special revenue fund budget, um, it's around 385 million right now. Uh, the bulk of that is our, the ESSER related funds. Like I said, I do expect the special revenue fund to continue to grow because we add as the grants are actually awarded. Uh, since we know that we're gonna receive IDEA and Title I, um, those are our entitlement grants. We include those in there before we receive the official notification. Um, we, we add it in as soon as we know what the amount is going to be. And then with the ESSER funds, we have what that amount is and it's going to be carried forward um, through June 30 of uh, 2024. So ESSER 1 and ESSER 2 will be fully spent, expended by June 30th of 2022. Um, so going into uh, FY23 and 24, it's just going to be spending the remaining amounts of the ESSER 3 or those ARP funds. We do continue to get some miscellaneous ESSER funds through the state, uh, but those are additional um, ESSER 3 grants that are for a specific purpose. And they're smaller, they're usually around a million or two million dollars. So the total amount of ESSER funds is $600 million. This is the, the same slide that, that you've seen in the past, um, but as part of the requirements for ESSER 3 or the American Recover, uh, Recovery Plan, we need to give the public the ability to provide input um, and be transparent in how the funds are being spent. Uh, so I do uh, present each of the, the slides um, at every single board workshop and every budget advisory committee, they are the same so that we give an overview of everything um, that we're spending the funds on. So we continue to focus on the safe operation of schools, which includes the emergency disaster pay bonuses, um, as well as all the COVID-19 related health claims. Because I mentioned that in our last meeting, we're seeing a spike in our health, and we continue to see a spike in our health claims. And so we do transfer um, that cost over to the ESSER funds. And hopefully we'll start to see a decline in our, our health uh, claims so we don't eventually have to increase our premiums. But that we may have to look at increasing our premiums by FY 2024. We have our unfinished learning initiatives. Um, we have the 670 positions. We still have, uh, you know, over 30% of those are vacant. Um, and, you know, it is difficult to hire. Uh, but in looking at the number of positions, once the grant ends uh, with our normal attrition of over 1,100 teachers per year, it will be easy to absorb those teachers back into the workforce. So no one will be losing their jobs when the ESSER funds uh, end. And we are funding our instructional materials adoptions um, through uh, ESSER. We also utilize it for social, uh, uh, 
social, emotional, and mental health services. Uh, there were specific requirements outlined in ESSER II by the Florida Department of Education that was over and above what was in uh, the federal requirements. Uh, so we continue to set aside a portion for those initiatives um, as well as technology. Again, those were additional requirements that were put in by the, uh, the state legislature over and above the federal requirements. And then we are required to pass through a certain amount to the proportional share to charter schools and then apply an indirect cost. So, the so you don't anticipate the need for the social and emotional health to decrease, right? For uh, so what we're... So you, you're paying for it now with ESSER. Um, so is that going to be an increase to next year's budget? Or we will the year after ESSER is gone? We don't plan to. The purpose of the funds and the purpose of what um, the, the direction from the, the legislature was to, to utilize a portion um, to help those students who were out of school for two years provide additional supports to get them back on track because we've been seeing increases in fights, increases in just um, the, because of the lack of social interaction during that period. So the, we're, what we're hopeful is that we will not need to continue these services once we provide um, these intensive supports over these two years. But also keep in mind we have the referendum as well. And so the, with the referendum funds, a portion of that is for uh, social, emotional, and mental health initiatives for the students. So we pay for co-located services um, and we expanded the co-located services within um, the ESSER funds. With the growth of the property values and the increase in the property values, we will be able to absorb some of the, the increases back into the ESSER funds. But the positions, specifically the positions we added, uh, we were not, the intention was not to keep those after the ESSER funds were. I understand that, but it just seems to me that the impact, the long-term impact on students not only of the, um, of the time away from school, but of changing societal conditions are going to be, require additional mental health services. And I guess I'm wondering if we're, uh, mental and social emotional, um, and if we're thinking about how we can, um, so the referendum takes care of some of it, but I think, you know, for long-term planning purposes, we should be thinking about what those needs are now and how they're showing up in students as um, they go forward so that it's not a surprise or we don't um, underestimate the needs. I agree and, and based on, I, I am fortunate to participate in a lot of national organizations, so the, um, the Council of Great City Schools, uh, ERS, uh, the Government Finance Officers Association, and we've, we've had teams present at uh, many of these organizations what we're doing as a district in terms of uh, the mental um, health of students, the mental and behavioral health. <coughs> and our programs, just related to what we're doing with the referendum, far exceed uh, what districts are doing across the country. So the referendum funds one behavioral health position at every single school. Uh, we fund uh, co-located services at 100 school sites. Uh, we were able to expand it um, further uh, with the, um, uh, the ESSER funds. Uh, and then the positions within the ESSER funds were more geared towards uh, uh, locating those students who were initially missing and then also trying to keeping, keep them engaged within school. And so, so it that specific activity won't be needed, yeah. We're hopeful that specific activity won't be needed. But when we talk about the funding cliff, that's part of the funding cliff. Okay, so we have these programs. These programs weren't intended to stay. But if we see a benefit from them, then we just have to look within the budget and start to prioritize and make reductions someplace else. Thank you. Uh, and so the, um, the, we want the public to know that they have the ability um, to comment on how we're spending, how the district is spending our ESSER funds. Uh, so far, we haven't received any feedback um, from the dedicated email 
Uh, we haven't had anybody uh, present uh, directly at the board in terms of how we're spending our ESSER funds. We have re received a handful of requests uh, through the board office, through public requests, just asking for the actual budget that was submitted to the state, and we've provided, uh, we provided that information. I'm happy to, to report, like I had mentioned in the beginning, our FY22 fund balance is actually no longer expected to decline. It's expected to not only be flat, but likely increase with the increase in categoricals. Uh, and then lo looking at FY23, both the general fund and capital project funds are balanced. Uh, we do need to continue to monitor enrollment. Enrollment drives our revenue. It drives our allocations that we have at the school sites. Uh, so we are, we are budgeting for just a very small increase in students of only 360 students. We do expect that increase is going to be higher, uh, but we were conservative when we were building, when we were building the budget. And that is a goal internally uh, to, uh, to promote what the school district does and to try to attract students to want to come back um, to the, the school district of Palm Beach County. So un unenrollment is a big uh, risk and concern. Um, the increases that, and specifically in terms of the family empowerment scholarships and what that impact is going to be in the future. The Florida Department of Education does not feel that there's going to be a significant increase in, in the vouchers in FY23 equivalent to what we saw the last two years. Um, they think that we um, that the parents are very aware of that program and those that want to participate are participating. So they expect to see uh, a more minor uh, increase within family empowerment. Um, like I said, I attended the, the Florida School Finance Officers Association uh, last week and we're all in agreement that we believe that the Florida Department of Education is underestimating what the growth is going to be. And unfortunately, when we presented what we thought the growth would be, it was not approved at the state level. They gave us only a small portion of what we requested. And where that's a concern is that we only get paid based on uh, the number of students that DOE projects. And if the, the number of students is higher and exceeds what the Florida Department of Education projects, all they do is take the money back from us. And there is no reserve set aside in the FEFP budget like there was in the current year. So all the districts across the state are pretty concerned about what that financial impact is going to be in the, uh, the upcoming year. Um, so we've uh, talked about the health claims and the concerns we face with that. Our one mil referendum in the operating fund that pays for those mental health initiatives and security um, the additional elementary art, music, PE teachers, and Choice and Career Academy, over 750 teachers, um, in addition to the teacher recruitment and retention um, bonuses, that represents over 10% of our district budget, and it's up for renewal uh, in November. And we have to go back to the voters every four years. And I'm actually presenting today to um, the Boca Raton Chamber of Commerce um, to give them an overview of the referendum and the importance of the referendum in, in, to continue uh, in our district. We're also facing the renewal of the local government uh, infrastructure surtax, the penny sales tax, um, based on what Ms. Evans you know, presented today. It does look like we're going to actually end that program early because sales, sales tax collections are so much higher than what were projected. And so it is important that we continue that funding as well. And then Ms. Schulstrom, to you know, what you were saying, the funding cliff of ESSER and what we're actually gonna have to absorb back into the budget because we just feel that it's a priority. Even though we int initially didn't intend to keep it, it then becomes a priority of, of the board. Uh, so we have our uh, tentative budget adoption is on August 3rd. Final budget adoption is on September 7th. So part of the, one of the requirements of the budget advisory committee is to uh, develop a report to the board, um, hopefully supporting uh, the, the budget that we've presented uh, on behalf of the superintendent um, at that August 3rd meeting. Uh, I do have a draft I, I included and I did pass out a, a copy to everybody as well um, so that we could take the time now to provide um, some comment um, and recommendations for me to incorporate. And you know, if the chair would be available um, to come to the August 3rd meeting um, to be able to present it, 
and we could also work together to incorporate those changes and, and um, so that I can add it to the agenda item for that tentative budget adoption. I was kind of glancing over it earlier. I think the only thing, um, I think in the past when we've done the report, when we've had referendums, um, the committee has always been favorable in re including something, a line about that we support the referendums or you know things like that. So if everybody's okay with adding a statement about that, that would be my only comment on the report. Okay. I'm fine with that. And know that even after this meeting, as if you have any other additions that you would like to add, you can email them directly to me uh, to incorporate. Well, I, I think Sherry's is the important one to get in there. Yeah, I agree. And then if um, I do have another meeting, if we needed it to come back to, if the committee wanted to review the report again before it's presented on August 3rd, we could come back and meet again on June 23rd if the committee thinks that it's necessary. Because I do have the room set aside uh, if needed. Does anybody else have any comments on the no, report I at this just point? Think, and let, if, there, if there's any change okay. um, that we would want to come together, but based on what we have, I feel comfortable not having it. Do we need a formal vote or just, yes. uh, okay. Yeah, so with this, we do need a formal vote. So I move we ad adopt or accept this report and use. I'll second it. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Aye. Nope. Okay, motion carries unanimously. Thank you. All right, so that's actually I, everything on the agenda. Yeah, just mm -hmm. to be sure that I was suggesting with the changes that Sherry made that we include the support for the referendums. Okay. okay. And we'll um, send out a final Yes. to the committee and that way you'll at least have a copy of it if there was anything glaringly different but I'm pretty happy with the report as is so we should be forward move it forward okay, okay. and I wanted to just thank Miss Andrews for joining um, as well as Mr. Smith for, for joining virtually thank oh, you. we can't hear you Miss Andrews I am I would like to thank you uh, uh, Heather, for all the great work you do in the committee uh, and listening to your comments about how we're doing uh, and the work we're doing to make sure that we have everything in place for our students, our teachers, our staff. Uh, <coughs> and the school board presentation was awesome. And we are keeping up as we move forward. But thank you to the committee for giving your time and service and your comments as we move forward. Thanks to all of you. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, seeing no other comments, we're adjourned. Thank you, guys. Thank All you. Right, thanks. Have a good evening.